Um, hello, everyone. My name is Kanita Williams. I am the chair of the American Bar Association's um, Division One Construction Law Forum Toolbox Talk Series. Um, and today we're going to have some interesting presenters presenting. So this is going to be kind of brief, only about 30 minutes, and there will be a, a short question and answer session towards the end. So please type your questions as they come to you. And if there's anyone specific you're directing your questions to, please put that in the chat. Um, but uh, today's toolbox talk session, which is the first one for 2023, so we're kind of excited, um, will be in-house counsel's perspective on how litigators can better be prepared and better present um, their case before arbitration. And so um, we also are presenting today with Division 11. Uh, the in-house counsel division. So we welcome them too. Um, and Patricia, you can take it from here and, and present our presenters. And uh, I'm happy to have you all here. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Patricia Thompson. I'm a full-time neutral with JAMS in Florida, but working nationally, uh, concentrating in construction, commercial, and employment disputes. I am delighted to introduce you to two uh, fairly new JAMS neutrals. Uh, most recently joining us was Leslie O'Neill, who has just come from being in-house counsel at Brassfield and Gorey, which is an ENR top 25 commercial general contractor, where she worked for 15 years coming there from private practice as a construction lawyer. While at Brassfield and Gorey, she oversaw numerous claims through arbitration, litigation, and mediation of every size and complexity and variety. And she is looking forward to telling you what she thinks counsel can do better. Our second speaker is Laura Abramson, who has um, who is also with JAM. She uh, Leslie is in Florida. Laura is in California. Both of them practice nationally. Laura brings extensive domestic and international ADR experience dealing with conflicts in the energy, engineering, construction, and chemicals industries. Prior to joining JAMS in 2020, she served in-house for 25 years as Senior Vice President, Deputy General Counsel, and Global Head of Litigation at AECOM, where she worked. that was her most recent position, which is a multinational firm providing engineering, consulting, construction services, where she oversaw cross-border disputes. Prior to that, she spent 20 years at Occidental Petroleum. So ladies, I would like to begin with Leslie. Leslie, if, if you could convey one message to your outside counsel about how they could better prepare for arbitration with you, what would that be? Well, thanks, Patricia. So the main thing I think that outside counsel needs to understand is the need to communicate with uh, inside counsel their plan for the uh, arbitration and how it's going to proceed, particularly which project personnel are going to be needed to assist counsel in developing the facts and then ultimately testifying uh, because, of course, uh, the construction company is in the main business of constructing projects. Uh, disputes, unfortunately, do arise and are not uncommon, but that's not our core business. And, you know, our folks get assigned to projects which take up, you know, their time and attention. And if a considerable amount of time and attention is needed to assist counsel in an arbitration or to testify, that needs to be considered early and put into the process and put into the calendar so that there's adequate time for them to prepare uh, and adequate time for us as in-house counsel to obtain the information, the data, the documents, the photographs, whatever that outside counsel is going to need to prepare the case. So I would say planning and organization are the two primary things I would want to stress with outside counsel. Thank you. Laura, do you have something you would add as the top tip? Yeah, well, and, and, and just building on what Leslie said, invite your inside counsel to come to the first preliminary conference with the arbitrators. I think that if you have their participation at that early conference, um, you can better make decisions together about 
as Leslie said, how to how to plan the schedule for the arbitration. You know, oftentimes um, outside counsel is afraid of agreeing to a shortened time frame to put in their evidence or to get to a, a hearing in six months or nine months rather than, you know, a year or 18 months because they want to make sure they have enough time to uh, marshal all the evidence, marshal their arguments. Now, your in-house counsel may a, be aware of, of business considerations that make a shorter time period, given the witness issues Leslie just mentioned, um, more ideal for them. But they also might be just willing to make cost benefit trade offs to realize that, you know, if we can if we do it in six months, we may have to give up um, marshaling certain types of evidence, doing certain types of, of discovery. But, you know, for us, a faster resolution that's more cost efficient is much better. So I think involve, you know, involve them in planning, but also bring them to that first conference so you can um, have their input in the schedule. Laura, you've hit on one of the themes, and that is time is money and money is money. I'd like to talk to you about the uh, cost savings, if any, that you see in using written statements in an yeah. arbitration. Yeah, thanks, Patricia. This is something that um, I have tried to import from my international experience into my domestic construction arbitrations. Um, in international construction arbitrations, like other international arbitrations, um, the direct testimony almost always goes in in the form of written witness statements. They're, um, you, they're presented with the party's briefs and their documents. It's called a memorial style of pleading. Um, and then at the hearing itself, what happens is the witness takes the stand for maybe five, 10 minutes on direct. They affirm their witness statement. They get asked a few background questions to warm them up. And then they're turned over to the other side for cross-examination. And this can be a huge cost savings. First of all, it eliminates the need for depositions because counsel knows what the other side's witnesses are going to say. They can more effectively prepare their cross-examination and in my experience and the experience of the other GCs I've talked to, it can reduce the, the hearing time and the costs by about 30%. So it's a huge cost and time savings to use written witness statements. And, you know, because arbitration is a matter of contract, you know, your arbitrators, if the parties agree to a new procedure, the arbitrators are almost always going to be willing to go along with it particularly where there's a cost saving attached. So even though written witness statements are not as common in domestic arbitrations, um, if the parties um, agree, I think your arbitrators would be happy to adopt it. And, um, you know, I would say, don't be afraid to think outside the box on this and other items. Leslie, do you have some cost savings or time saving tips about discovery or about use of experts, presentation at hearings, anything that you would like to raise at this point? Uh, thanks. Yes, following up on what Laura said, uh, I think one of the things that council needs to look at is being creative because you can do things in arbitration that you can't do in court and you need to use that opportunity. For example, if you have um, a case with multiple claims, suppose it's a construction defect case, and you have issues about windows, you have issues about the roof, you have issues about the air conditioning, um, it's sometimes more effective to group your witnesses and proof by issue and have all of the witnesses related to the windows testify in a group, not sometimes a panel, but sometimes just in sequence. But then the arbitrators hear all the information about the windows, and then they move on to the roof, and then they move on to the HVAC. You can't do that usually in a court proceeding, but you need to take advantage of the, as Laura said, the arbitrators, for the most part, are going to let the parties de design the process that they want. And this is a way of making it more efficient. Similarly, when organizing the exhibits, Organizing them by topic, organizing them by claim is much more efficient and helps the arbitrators do their job. Following up on the concept of time is money and money is money, the most expensive um, part of the case is when you have the three arbitrators working on something. 
having three arbitrators searching through exhibits looking for something is not an efficient way of um, managing it. Having paralegals create summaries and create executive summaries and create topical indexes is a great way to shorten the time that arbitrators who are busy people have to spend looking for the proof of your claims. Similarly, with experts, you don't always have to have a 200 page report. You could have an executive summary. And then in arbitration, there is the uh, kind of colloquially called hot tubbing of experts or allowing competing experts to testify together and let the arbitrators hear them both and ask questions. Again, something that's not likely to be done in a court proceeding, but it's done frequently in arbitration. So those are some ideas. Yeah, and, and if I can just add to that, yep, Patricia, go ahead. Um, I would encourage experts to provide their opinions through a PowerPoint or some other sort of visual presentation, uh, either instead of or in addition to that written report um, at a hearing. I think that can be very effective in conveying the information um, to, to your panel. Um, and, and I strongly believe that having the same, the experts from the same discipline or on the same topic meet and confer without counsel and prepare a joint report setting out what they agree upon and where they differ, which again is something that's very common in international arbitration, but less common in domestic arbitration can be a huge time and cost savings. You know, you know, I, I recently in a domestic construction arbitration hot tubbed experts where they really seem to be talking past each other. And so I got them together after the presentation and, and had questions and, and had them both answer them. You know, counsel can be afraid of that, but it really, um, I think, serves your client's interest because if the arbitrator can, can be listening to them and understand where they agree and where they disagree, you know, you get to the heart of the issues much more quickly. And where there's models that have to be run, being able to get both parties input on that can really help the arbitrators when it comes to damages. And I think, you know, Leslie, you and I were talking about this with Patricia when we were planning for this, you know, I think we, we both think that one of the areas that the parties want to focus more on um, and, and it sometimes gets short shrift is damages. I know you have some thoughts on that. Yeah. Yes. Go right ahead and ask the questions, Laura. I'll just be <laughs> delighted to listen. No, um, I absolutely. I was planning to get to damages. Um, what's wrong with the way people put on damages proof in arbitration? Leslie? Well, as Laura mentioned, I think a lot of times damages are kind of pushed off to the end of the case in terms of planning. Uh, there's so much focus on the liability, you know, the delay analysis or the defect you know, the cost of repair and all of those things that, you know, council gets too busy to think of how are we going to put on the damages. But of course, you know, a liability without damages is a zero. You know, you don't, that's what you want. And so putting on your damages needs to be something that's focused on at the beginning of the case. And when you have voluminous uh, invoices or other kinds of proof of damages, again, it's not efficient for three arbitrators who are charging you 600 or so dollars an hour to be sorting through those things. Summaries are the only way that they can realistically understand those damages. Similarly, you have to be clear to the arbitrators what it is you actually are wanting them to award. Um, I've heard anecdotes from arbitrators saying that um, part of the uh, reason that awards came out the way they did is that the party simply did not explain what the damages were they were seeking. And right. of course, it's not pleading, you know, in the same way that there is in court in arbitration. So it's all the more important in your presentation to make that clear um, and summarize, this is what we're looking for. And this is the evidence that supports it. And here's how you can, how the calculations were done. Do you have something to add on the issue of damages proof, Laura? I, I completely agree with, with Leslie. I think that um, the focus very early in a case needs to be paid to what are the damages and how are we going to prove them? Um, and I my, my tip would be, um, you know, 
at the beginning of, of planning your case and talking to your inside counsel, you know, focus on with your clients, how are they going to prove up their damages? You know, we had um, experience in, in a number of cases while I was at AECOM where, you know, uh, the, the time records um, weren't contemporaneously kept in a way for variations, for example, that would, you know, easily indicate or, or corroborate the, the witnesses um, testimony that they'd spent thousand hours working on a variation rather than on the main scope of work. And, um, you know, so if you if you've got a problem where you don't, for example, have the, the the time records that were contemporaneously charged to a variation, um, think about how, how do you marshal that? Do you have a way of do you have a witness who can testify about the the extra work that was done and um, and how are you going to how are you going to to prove that up? Um, yeah, the only thing I would add to that is that if you have a lot of components to your damages claims, a lot of change orders, a lot of separate discrete issues, many of which are smaller, you should think of a way to provide that in an Excel spreadsheet or a Redfern type schedule. One of the questions they've already received talks about Redfern in the, in the discovery context, but that idea of saying, this is this change order, this is what I think it is, this is what they think it is, here's the documents I rely upon, bait, 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 linked, linked, link, 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 here's the documents they rely upon, link, 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 here are the pages in the record on that issue. And then right there, the arbitrator doesn't have to search all the way through and look at their notes. It's, it's what Leslie was talking about, about making it easy for us, but especially in damages. And that's not what is done it's really important. And Patricia, I think the other benefit of the approach that that we've talked about and that you just outlined is, you know, oftentimes what happens instead is you've got expensive experts mm. laying out in their in their 200 page report each of these items of damages. And, you know, I remember just shaking my my head one time. We had a big case three week hearing in London on a, a on a, you know, $50 million dispute over construction of a, of a hotel complex over um, in continental Europe. And the, you know, some of the change orders, the amount of time the experts were spending, you know, was more than the particular item was worth. So you really, you know, the, the sort of approach you're suggesting, Patricia, with a, a Redfern schedule with the evidence, rather than having an expert opine on each one of these small items, is going to be more cost effective. Well, Leslie, another, thing, another oh, go thing, ahead, go ahead. If you go see, ahead, Leslie, if you see that you have, you know, a, a large number of small dollar items, this might be something that's appropriate to go ahead and try to settle before you go to hearing instead of spending the time and effort of counsel and paralegals and experts and everyone, I mean, look at it again, the cost benefit analysis for uh, inside counsel. Is it worth it to us to spend $50,000 on, you know, $50,000 worth of change orders? So those are, that's kind of a thing, I think at the beginning of the case that you talk with your inside counsel about you know, these kinds of items and uh, shorten up the things that are really the big dial, big ticket items. And let's spend our resources, you know, proving up and litigating up, litigating those. Yeah. Let, let me, or, or, or you you can't, can't, sorry, go, sorry, Patricia, where you can't um, just eliminate them right. and settle them. You know, we had a big construction dispute um, or hundreds of millions of dollars where, where, where we had, what we decided was those items that were under a certain dollar threshold, each side would put together a two page position and the arbitrators would decide those solely on the papers. Excellent. So we eliminated the expert evidence and the, um, uh, the, the testimony time on those. Um, so you know, in a, in a, in a smaller domestic case, you might set that, you set that threshold at a different level, but the same sort of idea could be applied where things under a certain dollar level, each side has a one page or a two page position and the arbitrators decide on the written submissions on those items. Again, thinking outside the box 
um, and, and coming up with ideas to creatively cost efficiently manage the process. Let's do that more. Let's talk about creatively managing the process on an issue by issue basis. In trial, you put everything in at the same time, damages, cross claims, subclaims, you name it. What can you do in arbitration and what should you do in arbitration to better use the arbitrator's time and to decide the issues in a, in a logical sequence? Leslie? Hold, hold, Leslie and then, and then Laura, sorry. Okay, well, we sort of talked about this earlier about you know doing proof by issues. You know the windows, the the roof, the the HVAC system. Um, similarly, I mean, you have a claim, you have perhaps a counterclaim, and separating those so that the proof for each is done in a discrete way, in a discrete manner, and everybody knows what is related to that particular claim. Laura, any more on that? Yeah, I think you should early on, again, you know, it, at least by the time of the first case management conference, but but think about whether there are any particular issues that are either stopping a settlement in the case or will drive a result in the case to a settlement. And let me give you just two quick examples of that. Um, you know, again, one was a very creative approach. Most construction contracts that I'd been involved with had tiered dispute resolution clauses. So we'd had our, our pre-arbitration mediation and there was, again, big construction power plant project. There were claims and counterclaims following a termination for convenience. On the claims, the parties were fairly close on the valuation, but the barrier to settlement was the counterclaims, which one side believed were completely spurious. Um, and so what we agreed to do was to, we agreed on three neutrals and we'd go to the first one who could meet a time frame. We would, each side would submit a very short written um, statement to that neutral, have a one day hearing um, to decide whether there was value to these counterclaims. And um, he would then he or she would issue their decision within two weeks. So we needed somebody who could meet that at like a basically a, a 60 day window. Um, and we made agreed on a list of people. And we just went and ordered who could who could meet that window. Um, and we agreed that if the arbitrator that the neutral who was selected would at the end of that one day within the two weeks say he, their belief was the counterclaims were worth between zero and $20 million in that case. And that we would then translate that in a formula to the settlement we'd agreed on the claims. So we found they were worth zero. You would get um, 8 million more in that case. If he found they were worth 20 million, you would get nothing more. So we had a base amount of the settlement that was gonna be adjusted. But that was a way of, of using a preliminary issue to really um, effectuate a settlement. Another example, was a case where there was um, defects alleged with air conditioning units that were supplied for a hospital in, in Bermuda. So you can imagine the air conditioning units were quite important. Um, uh, the, uh, the owner had made a claim against the um, insurance policy and had received the proceeds of that insurance policy. Uh, the question was, there was a limitation of liability cap in the contract, whether the um, subcontractor who provided the engineering design for these air conditioning units that were undersized, whether the insurance proceeds on their insurance policy that had been tapped um, counted against that liability cap or not. So that was a clear legal issue that by getting that issue dealt with first, the rest of the case, because it, because it was a $12.5 million cap on liability, $10 million was paid out in insurance proceeds. So if the insurance proceeds counted, it became a $2.5 million case. Um, and uh, getting that issue decided then led to the settlement of the of the rest of the case. So those are two examples where there's there might be certain issues that could be brought to the front and dealt with either in a creative way or by the arbitration panel um, first that could lead to a resolution of the rest of the case. And really, there's an infinite number of ways that you can make better sense of the litigation claims if you reorganize what gets decided first. Let's change one last question, and then we'll go to the, the, pan, the people here who have questions. The last question is, so chess clocks, hate them or love them? Leslie? Um, 
I think they're, they have a, they are a useful tool, but obviously like any tool they can be abused. I had a personal experience in a court proceeding where the judge used a chess clock. And uh, of course the, I was defending the case, the plaintiff used up all of his time. And then we, you know, he didn't have time left for closing. Well, the judge obviously gave him time because his due process rights would have been affected if he was not allowed to close. So I think that, you know, it's a good thing if, if the parties will use it properly. Um, but like any tool, it's only as good as the people using it. I'm and a huge final fan. word, Laura. I, I'm a huge fan of chess locks because I think that, and I, and I think you carve out, Leslie, the opening and the closing time. Yes. And you take the rest of your time and you divide it and you don't have to divide it evenly. You can look at the number of witnesses each side has, but I think it allows people to better prepare and they're going to make strategic decisions about which witnesses they need more time with or less. And I think you're going to, you know, you'll, you'll be able to keep to a shorter hearing overall and people won't, won't, won't waste time on irrelevant questions. I, I, I'm a huge fan of a chess clock. Right. So now we are going to open it up for questions. I see there's a Redfern uh, schedule question, but I don't know if there are any others. And so I am done and I'll turn it over to Kanita. Yeah, that is the only question I'm seeing so far. Um, I don't know if it was sufficiently answered. Um, one piece in this question, I'll just read it. It's, been, it's for both um, Laura and Leslie. Um, our red friend schedules regarding discovery issues used mostly in international arbitrations. Are they making their way to domestic arbitrations more often now? Um, and uh, let me just say they're, they're, they're standard in international arbitration and I'm beginning to see them used in, in domestic arbitrations. Um, I am a huge fan of a Redfern schedule. You know, the, the idea though behind the Redfern schedule is that in international arbitration, you're really only um, supposed to be able to get discovery of documents that are both relevant and material to the outcome of the case. And so what you do in a Redfern schedule is it's supposed to be a narrow either particular document or very narrow category of documents. And you lay out why it's relevant and material to the outcome. The other side gets to put in, if they're objecting, why they don't think it's relevant and material. And the arbitrators then take that to you and use that to decide whether to allow discovery of that document or category of documents. But again, it's, um, I think, much more efficient um, than uh, the request for production process that is common in U.S. courts discovery and has been largely adopted in a lot of um, domestic arbitration. So I would, say, I, I would say that a lot of things that are done in, in international arbitration, which are time savers, are finding their way into domestic arbitrations. Um, in addition to the Redfern schedule, which I think makes a great deal of sense, is just overall having an order of proof and a plan for discovery um, because unlike court proceedings, generally speaking, our uh, discovery and arbitration should be more limited. And so really it should be targeted. It should be focused to the documents that you really need to prove the specific elements of your case. And I think at, as in-house counsel, that is what I wanted my outside counsel to do. I did, we don't want every document in the file because we don't, if we don't need them, we want the things that we absolutely need. And that means you have to figure out ahead of time, what is it you need to prove the case and then ask for those things. Perfect. Well, Anything I, else, Kanita? Um, I'm not seeing any new questions and it kind of works out well because, uh, yeah, it's, I think it's that time. <laughs> so close up, is there any more questions before I do though? Speak now. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. In Thank the chat you. section, you'll see links to sign up for and register for the future Toolbox Talk Series sessions. So go ahead and sign up if you haven't already. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Patricia. And thank you, Laura. Pleasure. You're, you're Pleasure. welcome. We're delighted. Bye-bye.